Hello guys and welcome to the Value Hunt YouTube channel. Today I'm here to present a new format and this is the Ideas Showdown where two seasoned investors discuss uh, two of their favorite ideas and pitch it in a short 10 minute pitch let's say. Afterwards each, uh, each idea gets discussed and ideally the two guests will, would play uh, devil's advocate on each other. So today we had the pleasure of uh, meeting with Andrew Brown, a repeated guest on this channel, and Tristan from Hurdle Rate. Uh, he manages uh, a trust uh, back in Australia, and he's an ex Kelly Partners Group employee. Um, and the two companies that were discussed were Kelly Partners, and this was pitched by Andrew Brown. And I'll briefly uh, describe the business. So Kelly Partners Group Holdings provides chartered accounting and other professional services to private businesses and high net worth individuals in Australia. The company operates through two segments, accounting and other services. It offers accounting and taxation, corporate secretarial, outsourced CFO, audit, business structuring, bookkeeping and other accounting related services. The company also provides financial bro uh, broking, wealth management, investment office and other non-accounting services. This is basically a serial acquirer of accounting firms and uh, it's managed by a very unique founder. Um, his name is Brett Kelly. And so it's a very interesting business. And if you want to find out more about it, I highly recommend you watch the, the full episode. And then we have DSW Capital, which was pitched by Tristan. And DS, DSW Capital provides professional services in the UK. Uh, the company offers corporate finance advice, financial due diligence, business recovery, equity finance, DSW venture, wealth advisory, forensics and valuation, business planning, and debt and tax advisory services, industrial property solutions, and funding and advice services in the tech and media sectors. And you will find out more about their business model and how they operate and their fragilities in the following episode. And if you have any feedback, really, uh, please uh, make sure to leave it down in the comments because this was the first episode. Uh, I'm learning so much and still experimenting with what works the best. And obviously this model is very interesting in theory, but it's hard to uh, apply. So please make sure to, to give me some feedback and I hope you enjoy it. Good morning guys, today I'm here with Andrew Brown and Tristan, uh, they are both uh, great analysts and investors and I'm so happy to have them here uh, to, uh, let's say, start this new format of the channel and without further ado, uh, let me just give uh, the word to Andrew and maybe you, you can say a couple of words, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, well thanks David for um, uh, letting us join. This is. Um... This is cool. I'm, I, I think you're uh, doing a great thing on your channel and it's really cool and I, I, I like your videos and um, your work on evolution was really detailed recently. So uh, well done on that. So uh, I'm going to talk about KPG today and now uh, Tristan, who's going to discuss it with me, he's the expert on KPG. He worked there. He's the guy who... Uh, I'm pretty confident this is how I found the idea was through Tristan from Twitter years ago. Um, so yeah, I don't know why I'm pitching this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And Tristan can, and I can have a bit of a chat about it. So even though we've both invested, I'm, I'm quite confident we're going to see, we might have some differences in why um, it's a good investment. So we'll just go with that. Tristan, you can just jump in whenever you like. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on. Um, like Andrew said, uh, we're both invested in both of these businesses. I'm not necessarily invested in Kelly Partners anymore, but I was in the past. Um, obviously, I worked there as well, so I have a pretty good understanding of what the inside of the business would look like. Um, and then in terms of my pitch on Dallas Cofield Watts or DSW Capital, um, Andrew also happens to be a shareholder of this, so... <laughs> We have a pretty good spread of knowledge across these two <laughs> businesses. Um, to be interested to see how it goes. Cool, amazing. So uh, I think you could start, Andrew. What do you think? Yeah, sweet. Um, okay, KPG. 
The reasons why I liked it as an investment is um, is probably what I'll go through. I think first, I think that's important. Um, so the small and medium size sort of accounting business in Australia uh, is the inherent um, the inherent customer base is quite sticky. So being from Australia myself, having accountants in the past, got accounting friends, and then my family having their own business using accountants as well, it's pretty easy to see from how the relationship works between the accounting, the small business accounting firm and say my family business, for example, they've been to, they've been in relationship for 40 years now. And even though it's changed hands before, the, the stickiness is built up over an understanding, like that accounting business understands my dad's business, like our family business to a, de- to a detail which would be painful to explain to a new, a new accountant. Um, and it just helps that my dad doesn't have to go and like, like build that relationship with another accounting practice. So even if the owner has left from 20 years ago and a new owner is in place, there's other people in that business that like are really important to like being doing the accounting work for my dad's practice. So that stuff is, um, that was attractive from the, just the accounting model the accounting business itself um, has good sticky customers as my family is one of them. Um, accounting business, accounting work is necessary work. So like um, doing it yourself is, I would say, I don't know what the numbers are. Tristan might have more of an idea here, but I would imagine well over 90% of small businesses in Australia use an accountant. It's probably close. It's, I don't know how close to 100% it is, but they wouldn't be doing it themselves. Um, it's too it's too cumbersome. It's too complicated. It's too messy. And most people got better things to do than do like the tax returns and look for ways to reduce their tax bill in a strategic way. That stuff is just always outsourced to an accountant. So I would, I would call it necessary work. Um, Tristan, agree <laughs> since you're an accountant? Uh, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, um, I think you're pretty spot on with that figure. It, it would be, you know, probably more than nine out of ten businesses that use a tax agent. So, yeah, yeah. The tax is getting more complicated. Um, business structures are getting complicated. Everyone wants to like save as much money as they can. So that stuff's getting complicated. You need an expert's help there. Um, I like KPG's specific partnership model where they do this fifty-one forty-nine split in their, how they make an acquisition into a, uh, an accounting firm. And I think that makes a lot of sense from an acquisition point of view, because like I said before, uh, with my dad having, being in an accounting business, if the principal leaves, but somebody internally um, can step up into that role, that relationship doesn't go away. Like my dad is still with that same accounting practice. Um, because he knows other people, not just the owner in that business. Um, and that helps a lot with keeping clients um, through ownership. And I think KPG doing that 51-49 split um, keeps the incentives aligned, keeps the customers happy. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. It seemed very logical once I heard about it. So um, what would be the next thing? Uh yeah, accounting is a is quite a relationship business, and I think that's what I like about it as well. It's it's necessary, but it's also relationship based, which makes it uh, like long, a long term. Um, it's gonna it's gonna stand the test of time. An accounting business, I think, more than most types of businesses. I can't see a big disruption element coming in, disrupting that relationship between a small business owner and their accounting business. It doesn't seem likely in my eyes anyway. So I liked a lot of that macro-y big picture stuff. Um, back to KPG specifically, uh, I think the runway is really long for this model, for Brett Brett Kelly to continually find and make acquisitions. Uh, I think there's a long way to go in that um, in Australia for sure. I, I think what surprised me recently with KPG is that they've started to go into America, um, California specifically, 
And I don't know if there are any other countries, but they've definitely, I know Brett's spending a fair bit of time over there at the moment, but um, Australia, I, I always thought Australia was just a huge market in its own right for this model. And there's a long way to go just in Australia. So maybe there's a distraction with going to California. Maybe it's a massive opportunity as well. Uh, I don't know, but I think it's going to boil down to how you read Brett, the CEO, as a person and as a leader of that business. Um, and that's sort of what got me well over the line to invest was that I did speak with him a few times, uh, met with him in person and like, yeah, he might be able to talk underwater is how I kind of explain it to friends. Um, man, like those conversations were very, felt very one-sided and that's fine because he's passionate. And I think a lot of people criticize him for being maybe too salesy. Um, I've seen comments about that all over online in, in, in the online world all the time, but I think that's actually a misjudgment of his character. I think when you get to, when you meet him in person, maybe it's not even in person. I think you can get it in just the videos of him talking as well. Um, he's just really passionate and he's actually really focused as well. And he can, he can just, he has capacity in his brain and him as a person, he's got a lot more capacity than most. Like, I would be I would be just shattered exhausted after one day in his shoes yet he is he is a machine and the passion just oozes out of him anytime he gets the chance to talk to someone and anytime he gets it someone's going to listen um, he just he's just passionate about his business and that's great I don't think there's any problem there and maybe it comes across as salesy to some because he can as a comparison to other CEOs you know he's maybe less humble but He's got big dreams and big pictures and like um, a big vision and um, he's kind of addicted to his work and I actually think all of those things in a CEO is a, you kind of want to invest with those people because they're the ones that are going to uh, take this thing for 20, 30 years and it's his baby and um, yeah, I think that's how you get a really big return is being in something like this for a long time, partnering with someone like Brett. Uh, who's going to drive the train? He's such a good drive, such a good motivated driver of the business. Um, yes, yeah, so he's not everyone's cup of tea. I know that. Uh, my gut feel is that he is genuine. Um, he's a big business nerd, and I think he's just going from strength to strength. I think this has got a long way to go, um, and he got me well across the line in terms of making this investment. I kind of wanted to invest in him. And, and I really like the model at the same time. That's really cool, Andrew. Uh, maybe we could like uh, uh, go back to the, let's say to the beginnings, because I, I don't know that all the viewers are familiar with the KPG model. So maybe you could like briefly explain what, uh, what they are trying to do. And uh, maybe some key figures, I don't know if you can pull them out, but if you want, I can pull them out and just look at the key financials and stuff, but uh, maybe it would be good to to start uh, with the, like be, what do, what do they do actually? So, yeah. Oh yeah, well, Tristan will know the numbers better than me, but um, KPG is, is essentially a, um, I don't want to really call it a roll up, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an accounting business that's, Sorry, it's a business that's buying accounting businesses in this partnership model of 51% goes to KPG um, and 49% goes to the owner operator of that accounting business. Um, the idea is, is that with the 51% ownership, if someone's sort of retiring out of the, um, the accounting firm, they have an opportunity to have an exit and like the person who's wanting to come over uh, sorry, to the who has the forty nine percent? Maybe it's someone. Hopefully, it's someone internally. Uh, they've got skin in the game, and they don't have to. Fi- they don't have to pay out the full one hundred percent that it might cost to um, to pay out the the leaving partner, the leaving owner um, of that business. That could be. It could easily be a five million, ten million dollar like buyout. So splitting it with KPG and then having things like seller financing in place um, and all the ways that the new owner can sort of earn into the business as well. There's lots of, 
um, methods for making these acquisitions and there's lots of different nuances into these. But essentially what they're doing is they're just finding good quality accounting businesses so far in Australia. I think they've just got one in LA now um, in America. And as a head office, um, the support that they're providing is kind of minimal from my understanding. Tristan, do you, you, you're going to know a lot more about the support that uh, head office is providing the subsidiaries, but my understanding from talking to Brett and reading about it is quite minimal. Um, is that fair? Um, so the things that come to mind are like they take care of payroll, they take care of, um, you know, there's a, there's a few IT staff at the office. Um, they do all that. Um, they hold events for the whole group to attend. Um, uh, marketing, they take care of marketing. They have internal HR staff, so there's no sort of, um, or there's minimal sort of um, going to agencies and stuff for staff, um, or at least less than other firms. Um, just trying to think of other things. They've got onboarding for staff. Yeah, um, that's actually a fair bit more than I probably gave them credit for. <laughs> and stuff, yeah. yeah, that's more than I yeah, gave them credit I mean, for, you, for sure. You could go, there's a lot of small stuff, so yeah sort of all add it all add up together it's it's a big thing so mm. yeah it's probably you know that that pricing at sort of like the six and a half percent of revenue is probably pretty fair for what you're getting uh, yep andrew do you want to add anything before we we jump into the like uh discussion of how this can go wrong or uh like i mean tristan may have a lot of good questions to ask you and yeah uh, do you want to add anything? Uh, what would I add? Um, valuation seems a bit stretched at the moment. Um, that's probably from from if like if I was to look, if I hadn't invested already quite a while ago, um, looking at it today might not be as attractive as it once was. Um, but then again, I, I also think of like, okay, where where do I feel like this is going to be in twenty years' time? And I sort of work back for, backwards from there, and I'm like, okay, how many acquisitions do I think they can make? How um, uh, how do I think Brett is going to handle um, the decentralization of the acquisitions, or the de- like the ability to um, delegate responsibility? I'm still a little bit unsure on that, but I guess um, where I see the business being and what size it could be is I've always said that I think it could be sort of five to 10 billion in 20 years time. Um, and 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 look and working that back to today's price and valuation, it's like, okay, the difference between four dollars and five dollars a share um, is probably not that not that big of a deal if I can look long enough. Um, but yeah, it's it's it feels it feels stretched. <laughs> it's always been it's 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 always uh yeah yeah based on just even any sort of DCF or any sort of um, cash flow modeling that you would do. Uh, that would be my first con- little concern at the moment, and that'd be that's probably it. So I think like Tristan, uh, this is a great time to jump in and make some questions to Andrew. Literally- that's his thesis really. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I don't know intricate details, so uh, be kind. Wait, 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 how about you? What other people ask. You could just, say, you can even just say, how does this not work out? You want me to propose reasons why I wouldn't? Yeah. Like why would you yeah. like, yeah, how's this going? Uh, to work? Okay, being, okay, especially right. being um, someone who knows who's actually working. So I, I think I think most of it is in um, the way the, the structure with the whole subsidiary, like the fifty one forty nine partner and a driver, is pretty solid. Um, and generally, those are slow moving firms. Most of the issue is when I sort of think about the services team and then Brett's reputation. I mean, you've seen him. You've probably seen him before talk about political things online um he is pretty you know i think i think he used to have an account on instagram um and then he would sort of mix in the business and then mix in all of his opinions on various topics um that are happening and then i think at at some stage um i don't know whether it was like he put up a post or something but um he did talk about how he was going to separate those two things like he had a personal account a business account um 
So I, I just think reputationally, Brett is uh, such a strong character and such, such so strong opinionated that he could run into an issue at some point. Um, you know, maybe someone has pause of the way he's sort of talking about things, but um, or even the client base sees what he's talking about. Um, and then they realize who he is, like CEO of Kelly Partners, but um, and they might boycott Kelly Partners. But that's that's like a that's definitely a nitpick. Um, I think potentially to date he has been good at managing partner relationships, and I think partner relationships is probably the most important thing in this business. So getting clients is a is a task that's done by the partners, not necessarily by Brett. So um, if we're talking about like this is all organic sort of development, but um, if we're talking about sort of Brett's relationship with these partners, that's important. Um, obviously, Kelly Partners has the control. So it's not necessarily like they have the upper hand essentially. Um, but to alleviate that, Partnerships are typically multi-partners. So there's more than one partner in a partnership. Um, and then it's not a company. So there's, there's all there's shared liability, essentially. Um, but yeah, I think reputation risk is kind of up there. Um, and I think he sort of... I, I'm probably going to watch this, but I think he, he sends a lot of mixed signals. Um, so And probably overly optimistic as well. Yeah. Yeah, those are are great points, and uh, I, I think you can expand a bit more on them. But before, I, I'm actually super curious to to know how do you guys think about their depth? Because uh, I haven't gone too deep into it, but just uh, at a high level, I usually don't like to see too much depth on a company, and I know that they. Uh, Brett and KPG use a bit of that to make the acquisitions or actually they make it uh, make the acquisitions like fully uh, funded with that debt or something so maybe you guys could expand a bit more on that I don't know all right so I, I'm not gonna spit out numbers but um what what Kelly, Kelly partners does right is um, these loans are when they go to buy a business the loan um, they create what's called a special purpose vehicle um, it's a separate company. So, uh, and then Kelly partners buy shares in that special purpose vehicle and the special purpose vehicle, it becomes a partner in the partnership. So it's not like a direct correlation. They, they benefit what's called the veil of incorporation. Um, and essentially what that does is, um, it creates a barrier for sort of claims to go for, like they get blocked at the, at the, at the company level. Like they can't go up to the parent. Um, so if, if, if one firm went bankrupt, then essentially all Kelly partners would lose is their equity interest in that one firm. Like it doesn't go up to the parent. Um, and they make these loans. So just moving on from that aspect of things, these loans are eight year amortized loans. So, um, Kelly partners typically uses all the cash flow that they're getting from these firms, to pay them off as soon as possible. So that could be anywhere from, I think on average, it's like three or four years. So, um, and it's fully funded with debt. Um, so typically what Kelly partners does at the parent level, what they do is, um, no, no, they got really minor debt to be honest. And then all the debt is carried at these partnerships inside these special purpose vehicles. So, um, what they typically do is use incremental cash flow to pay off their share of the debt. Um, so essentially they're not using any equity to make acquisitions at all. So yeah, when you look at it from a head office point of view, it's actually quite, it's quite low debt, um, in relation to what they, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's like four or 5 million. So it's not much. And compared to what they're pulling in. Yeah. It's, it's less than one times, uh, so you you think they're sort of, they're sort of like, you can think of parent exposure, then like their total exposure. Um, and then the gap to that is anything that's held in the partnerships, which are all ring fenced. So none of that, none of it's, none of it's coming up to the parent and being claimed. But uh, what I would essentially think about is how much can they 
how much can they borrow of new debt? And they have covenants. So um, they're limited by the speed at which they can pay down the debt and the existing partnerships. So once they hit, once they get close to the covenants, they got to slow down in acquisitions until they can pay down the loans a bit, essentially. So it's really more of a, if they're close to the covenants, then you shouldn't expect as much acquisition activity. Um, and then if they're, if they're far away, then they might do a lot in a short amount of time. Tristan, do you know if there's any dilution going to happen with the listing over in America? Are they going to issue any more stock for that? Uh, from my understanding, there is, um, they pretty much put off the listing. Um, and that's why oh. they did the OTC listing, which is that announcement the other day. Yeah. Um, because it was too expensive. It talks about it in the um, the recent half year results, but it was too expensive to do at their current size. I think they said it would cost uh, 10 or 12 million. So too expensive at their current size. Mm-hmm. And if they're going to dilute a small amount, um, I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know the structure of which they would do it. I don't know whether it would be like a founder sell down or maybe like some sort of yeah, I read somewhere. Geez, it could be. It could be. It could have been hearsay. Yeah. It, yeah, it could have been hearsay that Brett was Brett was going to um, give up some of his ownership to do it. That was the theory. I thought. Um, yeah. How true that is, you know, it's not happening. But it's not on the cards right now. Uh, so. I think at this stage, it's sort of uh, it's it's all in a rumor mill. So I don't yeah. really have any good answer. Yeah, I think um, that's where I am I, too. I'm in the rumor yeah. mill too. <laughs> that's where I'm pulling information from. So, yeah, probably better just to wait for announcements. Um, do you guys think like uh, the the debt could be an issue uh, in the future if they don't manage it properly, or is it completely insulated because of what you just explained that the debt is held at a at a partnership level and not at the head office? Uh, Tristan can I, I would just reiterate what Tristan just said about the um, you just got to watch that the um, they've got borrowing capacity if they need to make future acquisitions so if they starting to if they go on a bit of a spree um, they might not have the ability to do it again if that makes sense um, yeah I mean the if they go on a spree they can go over covenants but what I think what potentially is more likely to happen is if they have some sort of um, uh, some sort of drop in earnings, like firm, like group wide, um, and it impacts the sort of the earnings, um, to this to the extent that it would impact gearing ratio, uh, and then sort of maybe push them up towards the covenants. But, um, I would say that is more of a risk than them actually taking on debt because you can you've got heaps of visibility on how much debt you can actually take on. I wouldn't expect them to take on more debt than they know they can take on. That's like, especially Brett, like he he's, he's obviously knows how much he can pay or how much he can spend. But yeah, I guess I suppose more likely is more of a an earnings impact. Um, yeah, maybe because relatively recently there was a bit of a margin crunch um, just because of the, the difficulty to find staff um, in Australia. Sort of alleviated now, but uh, I, I, I do know that it, it may become an issue in the future, but um, just the level of graduates coming out of accounting is is uh, lower than that it has been in the past. And um, how do you guys think about the dividend policy and like uh, how they distribute uh, like value to shareholders? Because uh, if I remember correctly, when I studied a bit the company, um, I think they they pay a dividend. Uh, how do you think about that dividend? Let's say. So this happened. Oh, man. This happened pretty <laughs> recently, but I'm they 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 announced that they're going to scrap the dividend, or they just scrapped it, or I think it's gone completely now. Yeah. So there's no dividend. Yeah. Um, so the dividend that was like just announced is the last one. Yeah. Oh, the one the, this month will be the last one. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Of yeah. That. That, that's. That's a good news. Let's yeah, and, and for the exact reason why we all hoped it was, which was this will leave us more money to make more acquisitions. So that was the that's the words coming out of out of KPG, and that's what we all wanted to hear. And um, yeah, I 
I, 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 but the way I think of Brett and um, his capital allocation framework, um, I, I, I'd back him. I'd back him in to make some pretty good judgments um, in the long term for KPG. Uh, I don't think he wants to um, slow slow it down if he doesn't. The, the, I think the dividend from my 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 feeling from why he's had the dividend in the first place and not was not trying to use it to compound was um, it was for him him personally so he could have money to like if you, I don't know how I can't remember how much he was paying himself in the early days but um, he needed he wanted the money like himself so he could have he could live in Sydney and Sydney's crazy expensive and he's got kids and um, like I kind of get it like. It, it didn't seem that was the way he was getting he was generating his wealth was was through through the dividend um and now that i guess he's come to the pressure of saying okay i've probably got enough wealth hopefully individually that um i can just plow this back into the business as that seems to be the the consensus from the investor mark the investor world tristan am i reading that anywhere near correctly yeah, somewhat. I would say that Brett has a bit of a, a slightly rich taste. Um, you know, he I think he owns like a probably up almost $10 million property in Mosman in Sydney, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, fair enough. Um, but he, yeah, he introduced the recent sort of 1% of revenue salary thing. Um, and then he's also going to do this CS sell down to like 35%. So 15% of $200 million is... $30 million Australian at least. Oh, it might even be more now because the stock price went up a little bit. But um, yeah, somewhere around 30, 40 million in Australian dollars. It should be enough for him to be able to live off um, <laughs> without the dividends. And essentially he's getting 1% of revenue as well. So yeah, he should be okay. <laughs> there shouldn't be any sort of future sell downs um, unless a shareholder really, really wants in. But um yeah, well, essentially, I kind of view him as he has a little bit of lifestyle creep, so a bit more than I would spend, but yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. I think like to, to wrap the conversation up uh, from the Kelly Partners viewpoint, I think, Tristan, you could expand a bit more on why you actually sold because uh, it, it strikes me as interesting that an ex-employee and someone that knows the company that well and especially a business that is uh, actually uh, doing well uh, in terms of uh, financials and stuff. Uh, why did you decide to sell? Um, so if you know how I am, I've got a pretty high sort of uh, investment standard, I, I guess, sort of 25% hurdle rate. Um, and that's essentially the discount rate that you put into the cash flow stream. So. Um, I like to think that Kelly Partners is probably one of the businesses that I can sort of forecast the best. Um, so just sort of one thing led to another. I just don't think it has the return potential. Um, and yeah, I, I, from what I can tell, there's there's possibilities for some, I suppose, optionality, if you want to call it that. But um, also sort of it's a pretty predictable income stream from my perspective so yeah i mean it would need to be a lot of optionality so uh i never say never i'll definitely be back it in again if it's at the right price but yeah just for me it's um as andrew said it's stress valuation uh, i think now we could actually move on to your pitch and see what you have to say about this company that i know nothing of so it will be interesting I i'll learn something new for sure um, so DSW Capital is, it's another accounting business. This one's in the UK. Um, and it is a, a more of an advisory business. So Kelly Partners is a tax compliance business. So like the, the, probably 90% plus of their revenue is tax compliance. Um, and whereas DSW Capital is, I would say at this stage, about two thirds, maybe slightly more of their revenue is actually in corporate finance. Um, which is in tax yeah. compliance. Yeah, higher, do higher dollar value. They sometimes get paid on success. So there's a bit of a percentage share as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's similar similar to Kelly Partners, but also very different. Um, so what they have is a, 
wait, I'll go back and say it, it was founded in 2002 um, by three guys from KPMG. Um, they were all partner level accountants. Um, and then they founded the business. It was a corporate finance boutique for about eight years or seven or eight years. Um, and then they sort of derived a what's called a licensing model. Um, so for any of your listeners that might know Keystone Law, um, they have a license model. And also Kelly Partners has a license model as well. So um, DSW Capital does not take an equity stake. Well, it's not their primary source of income. They have a small equity stake in some firms, but it's it's not it's not the primary source. Um, uh, so essentially, what they do is they bump up the license fee further, um, and it's a percentage of revenue. So they don't share in a cost base with the underlying firms. Um, but other than that, the cost base. So you can think of DSW Capital cost base as being very similar to just the Kelly Partners parent entity cost base. So if you were to strip out the consolidation of all the partnerships, the financials should theoretically look pretty similar. Um, So essentially going from there, they sort of two thirds of their staff or maybe even more than that, are X big four. So X KPMG, PwC, Deloitte or... um, What's the last one? Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young, that's right. Um, yeah, so, so most of their staff is actually poached from these firms and then the rest of them sort of mid-tier level firms like BDO and um, RSM and various other firms in the UK. Um, and what they essentially do is they, they, they're they giving them an offering to start their own business and they'll take a revenue share. So what they will do is they have the central services stuff very much the same as Kelly partners, like the marketing HR and stuff like that, um, finance, payroll, whatever. Um, but they also, they'll also help you, um, by funding your partner drawings for the first year or two depends. Um, and they do that through a 50 K grant. So essentially that grant is their investment in that person to start their own business. Um, in return for signing a licensing agreement. Um, And yeah, it's sort of essentially on average, those licensing agreements pay themselves off in three years. Um, And from there, it's really sort of besides the small amount of central services support they give, it's really like a royalty stream on that firm's success. Um, Yeah, I think... Is there any questions at this stage? I, I think the rest of it is it's sort a pretty of- beautiful business model to get that um, that royalty check. It's, it's very clo- you know, like you said, a royalty is pretty close. I would have said it's like, like a franchise fee, nearly. Um, yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah, um, it's pretty great. I would say, I would say probably the biggest issue that they have currently is just that they have too much involvement in corporate finance, um, so their revenue stream is quite. At this stage, it's quite cyclical because, you know, corporate finance is um, whether you want to buy a business or sell a business, it's really, it's valuation driven and it's also sort of funding driven. So it's at the whims of the market and the economy, um, how flush are business owners of cash, how how much they want to sell, uh, these kind of things. Um, so it's not, it's not a recurring business, not like tax that we have to do it every year regardless. Um, yeah, but they are, they are diversifying that and they have done that in a good way. Um, so they did an acquisition last year of a corporate insolvency business. Um, and that is essentially, if you think about it, um, if, whether you want to buy or sell a business and in times where you do not want to buy and sell a business, um, it's because you're in financial distress. Um, and then in times where firms are in financial distress, the business that they bought, has theoretically it would have more revenue because they're doing more um, insolvencies essentially. Um, they advise on that. So that was a natural choice to diversify um, their involvement in corporate finance. Yes. But they also have a number of sort of, I would call them uh, offshoots, tail end, small, just small things that they're involved in. Um, so None of those are really particularly big. Like none of them have more than 10 fee earners. So 
a fee earner being an accountant that sort of bills money. Um, whereas if you look at the total employees, that also includes admin staff, which is not doing actual work that's billable to a client. Um, yeah, I, I might leave it there and just see if there's any questions. Um, yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, Andrew, maybe uh, since you know the business better, uh, you could uh, ask a couple of questions and then I have a question too, just at the end. Sure. Um, always one of my concerns for, for these guys has been the, the ability to, um, to sell the idea to an uh, ex-Big um, Four person. That always yeah. seems like it's going to be a slog. Like it's going to be hard work to convince somebody to go out on their own. Like I, I, that always seems like, okay. So these guys are sitting, they've been running for 20 years. If it was really attractive for people to be doing this um, and they're the only, one of the only games in town, I guess obviously the choice is really do you go out on your own or do you use someone holding your hand a little bit and have a bit of uh, money to get mm. like startup capital. Essentially you're getting some funding to get, to get your operation off the ground. They're still really small uh, as a business and it's 20 years later. I guess they only went into this sort of licensing model 10 years ago or so, but maybe 15 years ago. But my concern yeah. has always been about the, the pitch. It's going to be hard work, I think, for a long time still convince people to go with them um yeah. and that seems to be a barrier um yeah that's my so that's one of my concerns here's the thing right i actually think the pitch is quite strong well like that's part of the reason i invested um here's the thing so when you're in the bit when you're in an accounting firm and you're an employee um typically on average maybe sort of 60 percent plus of your revenue actually just goes to the firm um, and then you take a cut of just like a your fixed salary. So any upside you're not sharing unless you have some sort of opaque bonus scheme in, in place um, where you share. Because I've worked in a firm that had a bonus scheme and it was just sort of like over this third, after this level of revenue that you build, you'll take a larger, you'll take a percentage share, but it's like, it's it's sort of peanuts. It's it's not like a, I'm taking all the upside. Um Whereas, so you can sort of think of the average employee might sort of take sort of 30, 40% of revenue. Um, and then if you think the DSW license fees are 22% um, on average now, because they used to have a lower rate, uh, it's like mid teens, um, but new, new licensees coming on at 22%. Um, so already they're getting like 30, 40% more they're essentially getting double the revenue. It's like imagine you had the same amount of clients and the same amount of bill, like billings, they'd have double the revenue. Um, and DSW co covers lots of that cost. They give them the work capital loan. So you're essentially taking the first year or two out of, of risk out of the business. Um, so I think that's an attractive offer, to be honest. Um, and where it sort of falls apart a little bit is that because you're taking a revenue share, um, if you hire new employees, you have to pay them out of that revenue share. So um, hiring more and more employees sort of dilutes the average revenue that you're getting. So um, I don't know if that, make, if that makes sense to you because like, um, if you hire an employee and you have to pay them 40% of your revenue, you're paying 12% more to DSW of their revenue. So essentially you're, the employees that you're hiring would be better off to be hired by another firm because they have more like sort of posting power for employees. Um, yeah, essentially that's how I'd look at it. So I guess why, so why then are they not bigger? <laughs> that's what, why do you, why do you think they're not uh, 50 million, hundred million? Why, why are they only at a hundred fee owners, not 300? Um, I think it takes time. Um, and obviously a big part of their, their growth is a working capital loan. So 
they only have a limited amount of money to be able to make these loans. So like, you could imagine where they were 10 years ago, just uh, like on their, their free person corporate finance boutique, uh, probably doing maybe a million, maybe one and a half million. Uh, and then they pay themselves out of that. So maybe there's only like 100K or something left over um, or anywhere from like one to 200K. Um, and essentially that's only enough to make a loan to about three or four people um, at their current sort of, standards at least um so they can only sort of go at a rate that makes sense like maybe they loan it maybe they could take a loan and do a little bit more but like it doesn't happen overnight essentially it needs to be a you can loan to more people because i have more capital like it's not it's, it's not like a, it's not like they can just sort of take on everyone and it won't take them it won't cost any capital like that would be ideal then they could sort of grow a faster rate but it because they have that working capital loan in place, that's part of the offer, and they can only do it at a limited pace. Do you think that they can get to the size of something like Keystone um, in terms of what are they up to? What is Keystone up to? They're they're in the three or four hundred. Keystone, Keystone has a somewhere around four hundred to five hundred. Yeah. Um, and then what they have done is they've introduced. Um, so that's 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 supposed to be marketed to sole traders or like just like uh, consultant lawyers. Um, you would, so I'll just tell you a bit about myself, right? I, I'm an accountant, but I'm an individual tax agent. Like I just do my, own, I don't have any employees. Um, that's essentially the same as what Keystone is doing. They're marketing to people like me. It's just individual lawyers that, that what they want to workflow. Um, so but the Keystone will just take a cut for providing that workflow. They have essentially a big, a big website. You go to their website and, or like a, they have an office and stuff like that. People go to Keystone for, for work, not these individual lawyers. Um, and then essentially, yeah, they have the network of consultant lawyers and then they'll pass them on to the work to be able to do for Keystone. Um, Keystone will do the bill, they'll collect the cash and then pay the lawyer. So their cash flow situation is also better. Um, whereas Dow Schofield Watts will, um, they'll do it in the reverse order. They'll, they'll bill the firm for a license fee. Um, over there. maybe I, I have a question here, like. Uh, I, I think I grasped the essence of their business model. And I'm very curious to know what's your take on their mode. Uh, is there any mode and what um, like, uh, makes it hard for other companies to just copy what they're doing? Uh, because I guess the, there's a lot of ex uh, big four employees that want to make uh, um, like become more independent and so on and get out of the ecosystem of working at one of these companies. Uh, so like, what's the, what's their real advantage? And especially knowing that they are such a small company. So uh, I guess they, they might benefit from network effect effects, but like economies of scale, they're still like uh, pretty small. So, and yeah. yeah. So basically, so uh, if you, you could expand. Well, like, while they are a small company in the grand scheme of things, they're still in like the top 50 accounting firms in the UK. Um, so in, the, in, in terms of accounting firms, they're relatively large. Um, and I think essentially like what you're talking about here is like Keystone also has businesses that essentially do what they do. Um, so does Kelly Partners, by the way. There's been copycat firms that have come along and tried to do what they do. But um, I think really it's sort of a reputation-based system. So I think regardless of where you go in professional services in particular, there's no, there's almost no firms that have a legitimate moat. Um, so it's not going to be like, a oh, yeah, this is contractual cash flows for 10 years plus. Um, no, they have legitimate competition um, and they have to you know, put up with the cost of employees, put up with the cost of what is the average market rate for this sort of service. Um, so by design, it's competitive. Um, the barriers of entry are not particularly large. Um, but I think that is why it's so important to have a strong offering to partners and employees because they're really, that's that's what, you're, that's what you want. Because as long as you have those, then you can find work because there's a lot of work out there. But um, most of the competition is around actually hiring people and they're trying to differentiate and do their own way of hiring people. It's essentially like, I think 
it's better than the average firm because they're not just doing what everyone else does. Um, so in that sense, it's uh, above average just because it's not the average firm. Uh, could you comment a bit on like uh, their financial performance over the last couple of years? Like, um, I I haven't done any research, as I said, on this company, but uh, maybe comment about like the net, like the negative net income in some years or like almost yeah, so, zero. So, yeah. So at the end of 2021, they, they listed. So it's a relatively new listing. Um, as part of that listing, they had to pay the IPO costs and all of those costs were expensed. That was around eight or 900,000. Um, and then they also, they also have a, at the time of listing, they, they issued some shares to their like sort of partners, employees, people inside the business. Um, but that was out of the out of the flotation sort of at the same time of the flotation. So it's like it was non-dilutive post flotation. Um, so that those shares are they have a deferred component to them. Um, they chose not to expense it all up front all at once, which to be honest, I would have preferred them to do that because then yeah, um, they would have this overhang for like two or three years afterwards. Um, those those shares are. Um, being expensed up to as of December last year. So on a go forward basis, there should not be such a large sort of share based payments expense, essentially. Um, so those are things to know. Um, they still do have some shares. Um, generally, these are sort of for the staff to have some alignment, those staff that don't have high insider ownership. Um, so they have they have two award schemes. There's one, there's like a PSB award scheme and then there's, a, um, I can't remember what the other one's called, but there's, there's two schemes at the moment that are that's sort of on a go forward basis. Um, so if you take those out um, and just assume that the business was um, operating on the same basis that it will going forward um, in the past, then sort of it's been profitable every year. Um, but like I said, the cyclicality of the revenue stream has a large impact on their ability to generate a profit. And also, um, they make they make investments in staff and their core and central services team. But they can't have they can't genuinely have the sort of um, foresight to be able to to be able to know like what next year's profit is because it's totally independent on the cyclicality of the um, corporate finance market. Um, so while they increase their cost base from hiring new staff, like I know they got a few extra, um, human resources staff. I think they brought on an IT dude. Um, they did some internal programs, which obviously sort of takes some sort of, um, people person at the services team as well. Um, I think they've engaged a consultant for some, um, some hiring as well. Um, these are sort of front, front front run investments for the future. Um, so while there might be some margin sacrifice to be made in the short term, then you would expect over time for those investments to pay off. Um, and also the corporates, like the head office team is very small. So just one hire has a massive impact on the cost base. So until they get to a point where, you know, one person doesn't have a massive impact on the cost base, then just a little bit of investment the minimum amount, which is one person, it still has a big impact. Um, if Andrew doesn't have any other questions, you can interrupt uh, at, uh, at some point. But uh, I have uh, two last questions, which are like, if in 10 years time, this business doesn't exist, uh, what would have happened? Uh, well, something that drastic would be reputation. Um, you know, I, I think of things like what's happened to the big four. Um, in Australia, for example, the PwC they they had a they had tax leak. Um, they a really big tax leak here in Australia, um, and yeah, they've been under public scrutiny. But they're so large, it's so global that it sort of that sort of event doesn't wipe them off the map. But um, it definitely has a big hit on their reputation. But for someone like the Dowsco Fed Watts, where they're uh, of a much smaller scale and a much smaller geograph geographic sort of presence, then that could resonate more. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think for something that drastic, like a drastic call like that, it would be reputation. Nice. They, they would find it pretty yeah, hard to handle being small as well. Um, a, like a like a major financial disruption of some kind, like a, a GFC style event um, where things just yeah where things just dropped off a cliff um, from in the in the corporate in the corporate finance world. Like M and A is mergers and acquisitions is still like like Tristan said, such a big part. Like if that just went really south really quickly and held and held off for quite a while, you would, I think they would struggle. Um, yeah, I think, so what would happen in that scenario, right, is um, some of their partners would have, you know, have to make the obviously sour decision to, to just close doors and go back to some other firm that can actually pay them because obviously they get paid on a percentage of revenue because they're essentially their own business owner. Um, so you might have a shrinkage in a corporate finance division, whereas even though other divisions are doing okay, they all have like a, a lion's share of their revenue has to shrink, um, and their cost base has to shrink. So they sort of like, you could think of it as just going backwards. Yeah. Um, I think that would be more likely than actually sort of not existing entirely. Um, they would just sort of lose some people, um, yeah, it would be pretty crappy yeah, on a like on a it, stock market point yeah. of view. That's how I see it too. Is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. so let's say they went from a hundred fios down to even seventy, right? Um, that would look pretty ugly from the stock market point of view, and it might take them quite a few years to get even back up to a hundred, which means you've, and even if the, the the stock price, the reputation of the stock just could get hammered for quite a long time in that situation as well. You could be sitting on yeah. no stock market gains for a long period of time, waiting for their, their the, the market to turn or the fee owners to, to start to accelerate in their growth, something like that. That's where I sort of see this as an invest, like from an, just an investment point of view, but I don't, yeah, I don't think it's going to like go to zero or anything. Yeah, I, I think you say the same of pretty much any technical yeah. business, but um, yeah, essentially... There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's do the reverse of the question, which is like, if in 10 years time, they are like 10, 10 times bigger, uh, what would management have like done to achieve those results? Um, well, I think essentially it's, a, it's probably just an inflow, like a very good inflow of employees. Um, but that would generally be the, the reason why. Like you mean ten times bigger in terms of business size, or like ten times bigger in terms of market cap? Uh, let's say like business size because that's what yeah. management controls. Um, yeah, well, essentially it would be because more people wanted to join the business. Um, it's it's partner driven. Like essentially, it's because people want to join that they get people to join. Um, Their sales team would be crushing it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and they have to. They, so to be able to expand that quickly, they also have to, um, assuming that their dividend policy stays in place, to be able to do that that quickly, they have to be able to have people come on that pay their loans off quickly um, because, you know, essentially it needs to be organic driven. Um, yeah, they need to pay off their loans quickly because they just can't have that level of capital expansion um, without running into some issues. But yeah, yeah. Um, that's it. It would be a great problem yeah. to have if they can't. Like they they they're getting that much inquiry for 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 people to join that they're struggling to keep up with the with the payment to um to get them started. Yeah, that's a I great. That's a pretty cool sort of, I think they'd have to have some sort of restructuring of that structure. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, there'd have to be some sort of negotiation process to be able to take more people. But yeah, um, it's because of people wanting to join that that's why it would grow um makes yeah. sense uh and like i don't know the exact maths but if you if you kept your high hurdle rate on this investment i mean they would have to double a bit le like in three years or something every three years like to apply a 25 hurdle right or i would yeah i, I mean if, if you were only looking at the revenue and the earnings of the business then yeah sure but um like obviously they have that dividend. Um, that's a big component at the current valuation. Um, oh, okay, makes sense. Oh, multiple expansion because, is the big one. That's where it's yeah, and then okay. and multiple expansion as well. That would contribute, but um, 
uh, I think if you generated a profit that was anything like last year and you take out the sort of exceptionals, then they would pay dividends. That was like a sort of maybe, what is it now? 63 cents. Um, yeah, it'd be like a high single digit yield. So that is pretty much one third of it just there. Um, and then if they grow at anything like the last sort of decade, then essentially what they've done is they've grown employees like 10% a year as well, 10 to 12% a year. Um, but essentially there is a big aspect of margin expansion if they can they can have some improvement in the productivity of their existing network. So um, currently the services team has a pretty fixed cost base, um, but in the last year or two, uh, the M&A market has really sort of uh, crunched really sort of died um, so any sort of return to business activity or business transfer activity um, that would definitely have a big impact on the on the actual margins in the business yeah yeah getting hit with those two things at the same time makes it look ugly with the with the declining sort of macro m a market and then the increase of hires at head office at the same time um, yeah that- that's really destroyed the earnings. That's 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 just crushed them from a. That's what it looks. It looks ugly from that. But um, understanding the still story. profitable, still have a lot of cash. Like they're still surviving. Yep. It's just sort of the cyclicality has really, um, really impacted their margins. The last Th- few years, at least. Thoughts about James and his age and his successor, the successor successorship issues. Yeah. So James is um, just so you know just some background james is james dow so he's one of the founders of the business current ceo of the business um john schofield is a non-executive director he's not in the business like he's not working as an employee in the business mark watts works in corporate finance i believe um they all have pretty big ownership like i think it's like james james has got like 15 percent. the other two might have anywhere between 10 and 15 um each so uh and then if you include all the other partners and stuff, it sort of gets up towards sort of 75, 80% for everyone. Um, so that's pretty massive insider ownership. But um, just in terms of James's age, so he's about, um, I might be one or two years off here, but I think it's about 62 um, around that age. Um, obviously he had like a pretty, so it's, Nicole burst out as his CFO, right? Uh, like up until June this year, but um, just recently she sort of tendered her resignation, but that was only months after they promoted her to deputy CEO. So he, he was obviously thinking that that was the CEO succession um, for him to be able to sort of take a back seat and so to speak, maybe not necessarily a back seat, but like sort of shift some responsibility. Um, and then she got an offer that was hard to beat essentially. Um, and she will be leaving in June. So he has to sort of, you know, that's been a pretty big uh, slowdown on his plans. Essentially, he, he is trapped in the business for longer than he would have probably liked to be. Um, so I don't know what that means. Maybe that means he's more receptive to a sale um, to appear. Maybe it means um, he will get frustrated and sort of won't be as much love and consideration in the business. But I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, obviously, he's one of the founders, so they, they want to take care of it. And also, there's widespread insider ownership. So I think that sort of takes the takes the. Unlike Kelly Partners, where he owns like fifty percent of the business, um, I think their widespread ownership is preferable. Um, just sort of th- takes the pressure off one person. Um, yeah, but I, I think yeah, I, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and just so you know, David, I did pitch it to Tristan a few weeks ago that he should uh, he should apply for the new CFO role at DSW. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I think that's a great idea, actually. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's it will be right? cool. <laughs> I mean, like, you, you would have to move to the UK, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> not not oh, amazing. Yeah. But, by the way, like uh, I know this adds zero informational value, but like they are up eleven percent this like in a couple of hours. So it's Woo-hoo. like uh, it's. <laughs> we, uh... <laughs> this is not live, right? We're not, we're not we're not moving the market, are we? 
No, <laughs> no. Definitely your top three hundred percent. But uh, you guys are, yeah. I think you you guys are moving the needle here. Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we could wrap it up here. Uh, I don't know if you have any other. Uh, anything relevant to add, uh, but uh, this is, uh, as I said, like in the beginning, this is our first episode in this format. So I'm still learning. Uh, I don't know how you should make it in the future, but yeah, uh, I had a ton of fun. I don't know about you. Uh, and yeah, if you have anything to add, please, please do. Oh, well, good. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. It's, uh, it's good to talk about, st- but again, Tristan and I both own these well, have, have owned them or owning them <laughs> currently at the moment. So, um, yeah, we we. Yeah, it would be advice. interesting to see if you can get any sort of situations like us in the future. Um, I think it would be kind of rare to have, but but um, especially with like businesses like this, like I don't think out of me and Andrew, I don't think there's anyone out there that probably owns DSW. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you know, it's been good. Thanks for having me.